I didn't test that one. Does everyone remember memory? All the bloating, all the leaking, all the faulting. It's easy though in Ruby to forget about memory in your day to day work, so a lot of us don't really have to think about it. Ruby has kind of a storied history with memory, from mark and sweep to lazy sweep to bitmap marking to uh, generational garbage collection. And if you look at the, the times on these and the dates on these, we can see that uh, we're already due for another garbage collector. So today we're going to talk about the state of memory profiling in Ruby. We're going to talk about some helpful tools, and we'll talk about some tips and techniques for dealing with memory in Ruby. But before we get started, my name is John Crepezzi. I am C. John Run uh, on the internet. And a few different things that I maybe you've seen before are IceCube, pastebin.com, and Easy Translate. Uh, these are a few of my projects. You can see more at github.com slash cjohnrun. I also work at Rap Genius. This is a screenshot of Rap Genius. For those of you that don't know what Rap Genius is, it's a page for annotating uh, lyrics. Uh, but now, we are no longer Rap Genius. We are just genius.com. And if you're interested, you can test out our new product, which involves off-site annotations. They look like this. So if you go to genius.com slash any URL, you can get an annotatable copy of that page. This is a new thing that we're working on. It's in beta now. Definitely try it out and let me know what you think. So let's jump right in. The state of memory profiling in Ruby. Who's familiar with object space? Just raise your hand. OK. Object space is a collection of APIs that exist inside of Ruby that give you um, the ability to see what objects are currently live inside the VM. So it has APIs like count objects. Count objects will count all of the different objects that are currently available and give you a count of how many of each of them exist. So if you take a count beforehand and you take a count after and you do something in between, in this case we're doing nothing in between, and you subtract the two, you'll get a number. Uh, you would expect that this number would be zero, but actually this number is one. And the reason for that is a thing called probe effect. So probe effect is an effect where you modify the results of an experiment inadvertently by measuring it, it by effective measuring it. And Ruby provides a way to not have to have probe effect. And the way for that is you can actually create these hashes beforehand and put them into the different APIs that Ruby offers. This is convenient, and in this case, you end up with a zero, as you would have expected in the, the first example. Object space also gives you the ability to go through all of the objects that exist um, inside of the object space. So in this case, if we look at this on a, a bare Ruby, just running object space dot each object, we'll actually get uh, the first 11 objects out, which are the, the different error classes and their string equivalents. It also allows you to pass in a type to each object. So you can give an individual type, and you can actually get the results back out for all of the different objects of that type that exist. So can anyone guess what these two numbers are, what the significance of these two numbers is? Any guesses? No? OK, so the second one is uh, basically for base 64. It's 2 to the 63rd, or 2 to the 64th minus 1. The first one is actually the random number seed. So these are the only two big nums that exist when you first start up a Ruby uh, VM. Object space also has some lesser known additions in object space.so. You can get those by requiring object space. And if you do that, you can do things like, for an individual object, get what line of code, what file, and what method that object was created from. You can also count objects by their size. So you can do the same thing with count objects, except this one will return the actual bytes counts. You can also get the individual memory size of a particular object or all of a particular class. And you can also do this very cool thing, which is object space reachable objects from, which will return all of the different objects that are currently reachable from that object. So if you look at this example, we define a name printer. Uh, it takes a single argument in the initializer that is the name. So if we create a new one of those and we ask what reachable objects are from it, we'll get the class name printer and the string John. So this array that is returned will actually tell you all of the different things that are dependent on the subject. And we can see in the modified example that if we were to immediately overwrite the instance variable name with a different value, uh, that no longer John returns in the result. 
So this is very useful to be able to track down uh, if you had it, something that wasn't being released and you weren't sure why it wasn't re being released, this API could show you the exact reason why and the exact objects that are holding on to references. So there's also these APIs called GC. So GC.count will give you, uh, GC's idea is to give you um, the ability to see inside of the garbage collector and see what it's actually doing. GC.count will tell you how many uh, garbage collection cycles have run. Disable will turn on and off garbage collection, so you can actually, for a segment of code, disable uh, garbage collection. Enable turns it back on. You can also get information about the most recent run, or you can forcibly start a garbage collection with a full sweep. There's also the ability to get garbage collection statistics, which have changed a lot lately uh, since Ruby 2 to Ruby 2.1. You get a lot more information on what currently the garbage collector is doing. Now we're going to talk about some helpful tools. So the first one is actually built into Ruby. It's called GC Profiler. So the GC Profiler, you can turn it on, and then you can run GC. And when you call the result of GC Profiler, you'll actually get information about what was garbage collected inside of that, um, inside of that cycle and how long it took. Uh, you can either look at the report that they generate for you, or you can use raw data to pull out individual details. There's also an API, uh, sorry, a gem called Memory Profiler, which is built on top of object space. And we require Memory Profiler. We can run a report, and we can create a string inside of it, and then we can pre-print uh, the results. And it'll actually show you useful things like how many objects were allocated uh, per location, the total objects allocated, the total memory that those objects take. Uh, it'll also give you a breakdown, a useful breakdown of the allocated strings and how many times the most allocated strings had been repeated, so you can track down places where you might not be freezing strings correctly. There's also these two, these older two. Uh, so both of these kind of has, have issues with current Ruby. Uh, so memprof, the problem with memprof is that uh, it doesn't work on anything above Ruby 1.8 currently. And the problem with rubyprof is that you need to actually uh, have a custom in order to get memory profiling with RubyProf, you need to hook in a uh, custom trace, which is essentially a patch set on top of your Ruby that gives you the trace points for, for memory. And what this really means is that we need to be building more profiling tools that are built on top of these new APIs like Object Space and GC, uh, because now the tools that didn't exist before that we had to build these custom events for, uh, now these tools exist and we should be using them to build new profilers. So now I'm going to talk about some, some useful tips and techniques and some different facts about how we use Ruby on a day-to-day -day basis and what we can do to make memory management better. So does everyone know about lazy enumerables? Raise your hand if you know about lazy enumerables. Okay. Well, this is a, a typical operation you would perform on an array. And typically you have an array, like this array of five elements. And the way that this goes without the lazy piece is that First, we make an array, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Then we make a new array, multiplying each element by 3, returning a brand new array with 3, 6, 9, 12, and 15. Then we only select the ones that are odd, giving us 3, 9, and 15. Then we take the first two, 3, and 9. But if you look at this example, we didn't actually need to compute the last two numbers because they, didn't, they wouldn't have made it into the eventual result set. So what lazy does is it approaches the problem the other way around. So it runs each of the numbers in this collection the whole way through, all the way to the end, before it does the next one. So in this case, it'll do one, it'll turn it into three, it'll keep it, and then it'll uh, put it in the result set. It'll take two, turn it into six, throw it away, take three, turn it into nine, put it in the result set, and now it has two, so it doesn't need to compute the last two numbers. So just by adding this lazy, you can turn your chained operations into lazy operations. And let's look at the effect that something like this has. So if we do a thousand times, we map uh, n, and we take n, and we raise it to the second power. And then we turn it into a string, and we compute the length, and we want to get an array as a result of that. This is the consumption that happens. 27,000 bytes, three arrays, 1,000 strings. If we make the same operation lazy, we now have 15,000 bytes, 3,000 arrays, and 1,000 strings. That's a 45% decrease in bytes. It's very good. It's a 100,000% increase in objects. It's very not good. So why are there 3,000 arrays? Uh, and this has to do with the way that lazy is actually implemented under the hood. 
the way that it's implemented is that each of the ones, when it goes through this mapping structure, actually gets put into its own array at each step of the process. So we take one, we create a single element array with one inside of it, we run it through the process, we do the same thing over and over and over and over and over again, we do it a thousand times, that's why you get three, three operations multiplied by thousand, so you end up creating 3,000 extra arrays that we wouldn't have to create otherwise. So if we were to do something at the end, we add a new addition. At the end, we decide we're going to select to only the ones that are even. 35,000 bytes, four arrays, 1,000 strings. Make it lazy. That's a 65% decrease in, in garbage collect or in uh, bytes. It's a 93,000% increase in arrays created. So this doesn't look like a very good story. Now let's look at an operation. Only 10 times, we can see uh, that if we do the operation only 10 times, that the numbers actually change a little bit. Um, and in this case, if we do it only 10 times, it's actually worse in terms of bytes created. It's also worse in terms of arrays. So they're actually, with only 10 times on this particular operation, is no benefit to a lazy operation. But there's more to tell still. So you can imagine, since that number uh, once was negative in terms of bytes allocated, and then eventually was positive in terms of bytes allocated, uh, we can look at, uh, over time, for the number of operations that occur for this particular thing, at every single thing you do, there is a crossing point where all of a sudden, in memory allocation, in, actual, in terms of actual bytes used, you cross this threshold. And this graph will look different. Uh, uh, the, the, the bottom axis of this graph will look different for every operation that you perform. But for every operation you perform, there will be a graph like this. So this is to say that lazy uh, is going to perform uh, better on larger iterations for particular operations. It's also interesting to say, uh, now we're creating a lot of arrays. And what does that actually mean uh, in terms of CPU performance or, or the time that it, the total time that it takes, uh, the, the wall time that it takes for uh, for the object allocations and the garbage collection the entire time. So it turns out if, so these, uh, on, the, on the bottom line here, is all the same amount of memory throughout time. It's just uh, allocated into different size structures. So you end up with, uh, essentially, the left side of this graph is, uh, is a lot of small objects. The right side of this graph is very few large objects, but the same amount of memory for all of them. And this is the amount of time that it takes to uh, allocate those, use them, and then uh, garbage collect them. So you can see that initially we get a dip, uh, but eventually uh, the less objects, and it's only at the extremity that less objects with larger size actually becomes less performant, and that's because the garbage collection time associated with uh, cleaning them up. This is the operation where lazy really shines. So the operation where lazy really shines is where you start with a large set and you end up limiting it at the end. Uh, and the reason that it really shines here is that it doesn't have to perform operations for the things that don't eventually make it into the set. So when you're using lazy, keep that in mind, that you should use lazy in operations that will end up uh, eventually not performing some of the computations. So let's talk about memoization. So this is a pretty typical, uh, pretty typical thing in, in Ruby. So we have a method called big thing that essentially does some large operation. Uh, that presumably is, is memory intensive. Um, and then we have small and medium things. The problem with this code is that if this object lives long inside of memory, that over time, the, uh, the big thing will stay in memory because each of the small things has access to it, even though the only things that we actually need are the small and medium things. So one way to fix this, and there are many ways to fix this, is to uh, to load the big thing, cache the small and medium things, and let, this will let the, the big thing uh, be garbage collected once the small and medium things are pulled off of it. So if you have long-lived objects that are loading something large and pulling small things off of it, this is a technique to not keep the large thing in memory. Now let's talk about string freezing. So how many strings would you imagine this code would create? Any guesses? No guesses. Okay. The answer here is 500 strings. So we're doing it 100 times. Inside of each one, we create five strings. The five strings are hello, space, world, hello, space, and hello, space, world. Does everyone follow with that? Okay. 
how many operations or how many uh, strings would this create? So 100 times now, uh, we're doing the exact same thing, except we're calling freeze on each of these strings. The answer here is 200. So the reason that it's 200 uh, is that we're doing now 100 times. Uh, we are freezing each of these strings. The only ones that we have to create now, instead of having to create hello, space, and world every single time, the only things we have to create now are hello, space, and hello, space, world. Now how about this one? This one is kind of silly, uh, but I'll, I'll get back to why it's important in a second. So this one actually is interpolating two strings inside of another string. How many strings get created here? The answer here is actually 100. And the reason is that Ruby can take these things that it knows inside of these interpolated pieces uh, and turn them into frozen strings because it knows that they can't change. So it actually turns this into essentially a little, little string, hello world, uh, with nothing frozen. Uh, sorry, nothing um, having to be actually interpolated. So the lesson there is, is this, is that if you create uh, a string with world and you create a string where you interpolate world, it'll actually create less, less strings overall than if you try to add them together. Uh, because Ruby will be smart about freezing the first piece. The second piece will act just like if you had hello space world dot freeze. Now, this is pretty useful. Um, in the future, this will become less useful because there will be, uh, have, has everyone heard about this magic comment that will essentially turn on string freezing wherever it can be, be done? This will become less useful over time, but this is a useful way to make sure that when you're accessing a hash that you don't end up creating new strings just for accessing the hash. So if you're going to be using a constant key over time, you can actually freeze the key and save yourself the memory allocation that would have to happen on every request or on every uh, iteration for creating key. Interestingly, this is not useful. Um, so a lot of people would follow from the first example that the second example should happen, uh, that this would actually save an allocation. It turns out that this doesn't save any allocation uh, because the, the two examples on the right are exactly the same. Lastly, we're going to talk about method definitions. So here's a class where we define some large string, and then we have a method. And it turns out if you define a class like this, uh, that after the class gets defined, if you run garbage collection, that the string will be garbage collected. Uh, this makes sense because there's nothing inside of this class that can actually access that string. Once the class is initialized, there's nothing left to play with string. So if we do the same here, we can do this class eval. So we can class eval hello, uh, and the same thing, string b, garbage collected. Now something three, define method hello. Uh, this is a little bit different of a story. So definitely if you're using define method, keep this in mind. The thing is here that the string with all the Cs will never be garbage collected because there could be something inside of define method that would have closure context on the string, thus never garbage collecting it. It's very easy to forget about memory. I hope that this talk has given you an overview of the tools that exist newly in Ruby, inspired you to maybe play with uh, the profiling tools um, and the different tools that I described, and be more cautious and conscious about the things you do in your everyday Ruby code. Uh, obrigado. Hello. Oi, oi. So, in the when you use the string in as a key for the hash, what the, like using a symbol would be the same thing because it would never get uh, like uh, recreated in memory. It would be the same that use the freeze on a string. Yeah. So, um, so the question is that uh, when you access a hash um, with the string. Will it be the same as using a symbol in that case? Yeah, like if, yeah. You, if you use the freeze, sure. it will be the same thing, right? So it, so it will be the same thing. Uh, this is only a, a new advent that you have access to this freeze. Uh, in fact, like, it, you can think of this similar to interning. Uh, in fact, on string, there's actually a method, an older method, for those who have been around in Ruby for a long time, called intern, which you now probably know as 2sim, yeah. which turns a string yeah. into a symbol. 
Uh, this is very similar to that. Um, if your hash is indexed on strings, you'll still need to use freeze. But if you're using a hash with indexed on nice. strings, they're identical. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? All the red okay, thank you. I have some t-shirts if anyone's interested. Um, I have a whole bunch of t-shirts, sunglasses, tank tops. If anyone wants anything, just find me after my talk. Thank you. <laughs>